Good morning, everybody. It's a treat to be here this morning. Uh, I do need to point out that the word videotape wasn't in the first conversation that I had about this uh, meeting. So I think it's only fair that the cameras focus on the people coming in while I'm talking who think that I'm Rick Havda. <laughs> because I think, uh, you know, we have to have a little flexibility, a little flexibility, a little element of surprise in this. Um, yesterday, Roland said to us that one of our shared challenges is to change school teaching and learning from the way that it has been practiced for nearly a century and a half. Uh, I think we all nodded and sighed and agreed that, that that change is really what everyone in this room is about. And so what I'm going to talk to you this, about this morning is really just telling you a story of change. And we heard several change stories yesterday. I'm remembering when um, uh, Kati, I think, from Greenland, do I have your name right, I hope, said that you got stuck. How many of us working in any kind of, of change initiative get stuck? Sometimes it seems like we spend more time stuck than we do moving forward. Um, the title of my little sharing this morning is uh, From Just In Case to Just In Time. And I'm not going to explain that just yet. Hopefully, as we move through the next few minutes together, uh, that will become clear. But basically, this is just a story, a story of what has happened in Memphis, uh, where we've been, where we are, and where we hope to go. Let's see if I can get to the next slide. In the beginning, all stories have to start in the beginning. Uh, Rick Havda was the dean of our college at the University of Memphis. Uh, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He's at San Diego State, as you all know. But fortunately, the work that he began uh, continues. And Rick not only saw the creed standards as uh, a way to teach in the K-12 arena, a way hopefully to prepare teachers, but also as a framework for the interactions of all of us within the college. And so the, the notion of bringing the context to the table, of engaging in joint productive activity, uh, that led to setting goals and norms that kept the spirit of creed. Not necessarily did we talk about we're doing this the creed way, but it brought the spirit of creed to the college. And that spirit sort of provided the foundation for everything we've done since. I don't see Kathy yet. I think she's coming later this morning. Kathy is no longer at the University of Memphis either, unfortunately. We seem to have a history of driving people off. But Kathy had discovered a creed in her own high school teaching experience and embraced the creed strategy as a way to reach the children that she hadn't been able to reach before. And so committed did she become to those principles that when she came to the university and began to work with uh, pre-service teachers in our college, she structured all of her own courses in a creed methodology so that rarely, if ever, did the whole class sit and receive a lecture. They came, got in small groups immediately, engaged in uh, conversation in small groups, in joint productive activity and language and literacy um, activities and engagements that got them to the learning uh, goals that she had set for them. As a result of Kathy's work and the professional development that she provided, we had individual faculty members of the in the college who either went a little bit toward creed and changed the way that they delivered instruction or embraced creed totally and set their, their courses up in a very similar way to, to what Kathy had done. And the, the, the power of this sort of sea change, this very subtle change, um, is evident in the words of the faculty. So some who just made small changes, if you actually start at the bottom there, uh, one faculty member who used to just have students describe their philosophy of education and write it out in an essay, now has them engage in the activity in groups of creating a school with no budgetary uh, requirements. What would the school look like? And then going back from that to figuring out how that reflects their philosophy of teaching. It's a small change, but it's a huge change. So we have faculty who did that kind of thing, who perhaps started uh, their class with getting into groups, 
uh, uh, telling about three books that you think everybody should read and why are they important. Imagine the growth that comes out of just that initial conversation. So those are some sort of small things that happened. And then we have folks who basically embraced Creed totally and set up their courses in that way. So we have the little pebble in the pond and, and the ripples move out. Then in, um, well, I guess it's been four years ago now, we received a federal teacher quality enhancement grant. You know, I'm, I feel the same way you do, I think, about how much we have to talk about grants in order to, to pilot major change. It just seems like it's so hard to do without that boost. And the idea of how to, to, to go far enough in your pilot that you have sustainable pieces, I think, is one of the challenges, again, that we face. I don't know what we do without ours. Yesterday we talked about rigor, relevance, and relationships, and our three R's are recruitment, retention, and reinvention. I think uh, we had recruitment and retention yesterday as well. But the idea was that we would put a pilot program together that would be a Cadillac model in, in representing some of the things that we seriously believe in, to see what then we could glean from that and put into, <coughs> excuse me, our teacher preparation programs. Uh, the, Three R's, I'm going to just give you a brief overview. The three R's program was designed to attract individuals with degrees in math and science into middle school teaching. Uh, that I'm sure you all have been in alternative programs across the country. The math and science void that we have helps us get some federal money. And that's what we were trying to do. But we were also targeting uh, African American males to the extent that we could. Uh, Memphis has been slower to have to face the uh, ELL, second language learner situ uh, situations that so many of you have lived with for such a long time. Our issues are primarily socioeconomic. Uh, our minority, which is the majority in Memphis and has been some time, is the African American population. So one of the goals of this program was to bring teachers into the middle school, that volatile, hormone-laden time, uh, who could serve as role models for these at-risk children. So that was th the first goal. The second goal was to set up a program that was uh, based on performance. With performance assessments, we really used the National Board for uh, Professional Teaching Standards model and put performances together based on the pillars of uh, practice that I'll talk to you about in a minute. This was a residency model. And talk about a Cadillac, but boy did it work. We worked with partner middle schools that were identified as high performing. Uh, Rick's philosophy was always, if they only eat hamburger, how will they know what steak tastes like? If we put them in poor schools, how will they know what teaching and learning can look like when it's done well? So we had three of the best middle schools in town. And in each of those schools, one teacher was removed from her classroom to serve as the clinical faculty member to support the fellows in her school. I say her because they happen to be all female. Um, and then each of our fellows shared a classroom as teacher of record. So they had an intense summer, then they shared a classroom as teacher of record. It was a full-time position with half responsibility, so they were there to support each other. And the clinical faculty person was in that school to serve as their full-time mentor. That was her only job for the year. In the following year, we had a full-time mentor who visited all of them at least once a week. And the New Teacher Center model out of Santa Cruz is the one that we use in Memphis. We are a center for the New Teacher Center uh, model and our training center there. So a lot of what you talked about yesterday in terms of the way that you coach and mentor your uh, in-service, pre-service teachers is very similar to, to what we did. We were fortunate that uh, our mentor, who was a, an exemplary educator in Tennessee, was able to, to work with our folks every week. So the idea was not to help them survive, although that's always part of it, but to push them so that by the end of that first full year of teaching, they would really look like a third or fourth year teacher and they would stay. So those are the major elements of the model that we put in place. Uh, as I said, it was a three-year pilot program. We had two cohorts. And uh, another foundational piece of that that came from the work we did, the three R's type work, 
was the development of the college's conceptual framework. Those of you who are in IHEs know we have to do that for NCATE, so we get the picture. But what is key here is those six pillars. I don't really know if you can read them, but particularly the pedagogy and instruction. The idea of that pillar was, was creed-based, that we would put the, the creed principles and standards in everything that we do around pedagogy and instruction. And the knowledge of the learner, uh, that's that second pillar, is really uh, powerful in terms of knowing who you're working with. The three R's fellows went to an ex, uh, experiential learning, uh, three-day exciting adventure uh, in Arkansas. This is the kind of thing that uh, corporate folks do all the time. Educators rarely have a chance to do. But since we were working with a cohort, we took them out where we you know, climbed trees and, and did scary things and solved very complex problems together. So building with these folks in an isolated place a sense of teamwork and camaraderie, a sense of understanding themselves, the way they learned, uh, working together, engaging in complex uh, learning tasks together, and joint productive activity. And they um, that developed that collegiality that takes a cohort through the tough times. The Team Trek experience, I think, in terms of both supporting the, the learning principles that we're all talking about and creating the cohort that gets you through the tough times is, is pretty key. Uh, in the classroom with the at-risk uh, students that we serve. We really focused on connecting the learn learning to the students' lives and facilitating the learning through joint productive activity. Those were the pieces that we really worked on through the mentor coaching relationship. Those are two of our uh, first year fellows, Dana over there in the left um, with some of her kids. And, uh, and over here we have Blair. So uh, I always like to show off our fellows, especially when they look happy. So the three R's program took that pebble in the water and spread it a little further. All the faculty who worked with these cohorts worked together, so our faculty began to be more collegial, yes, less siloed than they typically are. And they also pushed the creed uh, ways of doing things, the joint productive activity, the hands-on activities, the dialogue in their classes with the hope and expectation that these fellows would then go out in their own classrooms and do the same. Um, we really do believe that you teach the way you were taught and that just going out and sort of spraying and praying that somebody will, will do it this way because we tell them to doesn't really work. So trying to institutionalize um, that way of learning was key for us. And we could see the impact, and we can see the impact on our programs. But as all good grants do, um, this one is coming to an end. So the story continues with what happens next. And what is happening next, interestingly, is our Tennessee Board of Regents, which is one of the uh, two governing bodies of higher ed institutions in our state, um, is working with uh, everyone across the state, actually, the legislature, uh, the, ten the Tennessee system, the UT system, um, practitioners in the K-12 arenas to create and implement an action for change in teacher preparation and it's called the Teaching Quality Initiative and I, the difference between teaching and teacher is key here. Everyone knows that the teacher is the most important factor in a, in a child's life. It's the, the teacher who, who has the most influence. But there is a whole a uh, bunch of stuff around that teacher. And one of those, um, one of the, the impactful things is the professionalization of teaching. How are teachers viewed? How are they rewarded? So that's one sort of strand of the Teaching Quality Initiative. Another one is, again, we say that we, we tend to teach the way we were taught by the time we get uh, pre-service teachers. And I understand by the time you get them, they've already gone through three years of drill and kill in chemistry or math or whatever is going on in, in the liberal arts area or in the arts and sciences area. So one of this, the legs on this TQI stool is trying to get arts and sciences, liberal arts faculty to teach in a more interactive, creed-based way. 
Are we going to be successful there? I don't know, folks, the jury's out, but what a wonderful goal to think that freshmen and sophomores, instead of sitting in classes of 500 people and being lectured to for 50 minutes, might actually engage in interactive activity, joint productive activity, dialogue, cognitive uh, stretching, problem solving. So hopefully uh, that will go somewhere. But the piece I want to talk uh, to you about today is that, oh, the, the pieces I have listed. There's also a determination that our pre-service teachers will get in schools sooner and in a more interactive way than they typically do. And that uh, teacher education, the, the completion of a teacher education program and therefore certification and licensure will be based on uh, performance assessments. That there's sort of a, a check off, not just to finish the courses. And we've been working toward that for some time and we did that in three hours as well. So we're all kind of on the same page. The key uh, piece that I wanna talk to you about today and get it, you know, a little bit engaged in, I hope, is the notion of using problem-based learning as the primary strategy for instructional delivery for our teachers. The primary strategy. This is a huge leap and a very important goal. And I know that we're going to get it, at it in very small baby steps, but we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. What is problem-based learning and how, is, how does it parallel the creed work that you all are doing and what do we need to do to move from where we are to a truly problem-based orientation? Uh, and I, we're gonna do this really quickly, but we don't use the word creed. We don't even use the word joint productive, words joint productive activity when we talk about problem-based learning in Tennessee. But as folks who are, as professionals who are steeped in what creed means, just sort of keep in mind as we talk about problem-based learning what the parallels are and how we can uh, leverage the notion of uh, problem-based learning to move the creed principles and values forward. Okay, the problem-based learning first steps for us, and I'm, I'm going to be real uh, frank with you here. When we sort of all came together across the state to have the problem-based learning workshop, um, it took a long time for most of us to get it, and it took a really long time for me to make the connection between the creed work and this work. So it wasn't intuitive, and I'm sort of skipping along here, because the model that we were given is from the University of Missouri Medical School. And our first workshop was uh, given by Dr. Michael Hasakawa, who came and presented for us a case, a problem, that was a medical problem. Joe Smith, comes to you with back pain, you know, and, and what do you need to know in order to treat his back pain, and what is the diagnosis? And it, it was given to us as an example like that. And all of us went, sure, you know, that's easy. It's a case. You know, we've watched House. We know how this works. You know, you have your symptoms. You do your tests. You spend a lot of money. You get your diagnosis. You give a prescription or do surgery. You know, this does not match education. We don't come with a case and a diagnosis and a prescription. We are very, very different. So there was some pushback uh, about the whole model. And we went back home trying to write cases that would fit education. And what we ended up doing was covering the world. And teaching is so complicated. So we write this case that would take a whole semester. And oh, by the way, could only be when you're a senior because we would have had to give you all the information first before you could tackle the case. The shift from understanding that the case itself is the vehicle for learning was huge for us. The idea also that you don't cover the whole world in a case you narrow it down, you figure out what your learning goals are, and you write the case for that goal. If there's extra learning that goes on in the solving of that problem, woohoo, that's great. But you can't assume on the front end that with one problem, a, a brand new person can learn how to manage a class and do special ed and do assessments, and you know all the things that we have to do. So it was a learning process for us. And the aha moment came when we went to the medical school and observed medical students in this model. I'm the biggest skeptic on the planet, folks. I didn't want to go, it was January, it was the middle of an ice storm. I could not really see that this was going to be beneficial. 
we went and sat in on the presentation of a case for first year medical students in their second semester. They'd had their whole uh, first semester of medical school preparation in a problem-based model. They spent every morning, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday working on a problem-based case. They were graded on not only the learning, but the interaction that they had uh, within the group. And their lectures, the typical medical school lectures, were maybe four or five hours a week uh, sort of uh, spaced out, not even at any particular time. So they didn't go to class and get lectured to. They didn't have long strings of bones and muscles to memorize. They, they learned them as they needed to through the case, just in time, not just in case. And what we tend to do, all of us, is give, I want to give you every piece of information I have. I want to prepare you in advance for every situation you can encounter. When you actually encounter it, are you likely to be able to go back into that thick bunch of stuff I gave you and remember where it was? Probably not. But if you've gone out and found it to solve the problem with which you're faced, it's a different level of learning. And we began to get it that morning. And then we sat in a two-hour discussion with these young students. And one of the things that uh, had been a pushback from our faculty is, well, we can't do a medical school model. These, these are the best and the brightest. These are the really smart kids. You know, we wish we got those in teacher ed, but we really don't. They're really not going to be capable of doing this. <laughs> well, let me tell you that those young medical students were more terrified of a change in the, way, uh, in the way that they learned, the way that they were going to be taught, than any of our students would be because they had been so successful in the old model. They were getting their comfort zone taken away from them. They could memorize it. You give it to me, I can spit it back. So that, that, that argument sort of disintegrated. And the other thing that, uh, that was a, a pushback for us is, the, the notion of how do you prepare with, with all the knowledge and all the information people to do a case. And the aha was you can learn the typical from the atypical. So if you have a case where a fourth grade child is reading like this in, your, in, in a reading class, in order to figure out if that child is reading normally or not, what do you need to know? What's the normal range of reading performance for that grade and that age? Does that make sense? For some reason, it took us a while to figure that out. Um, but the idea that if the cases are created well, the learning that will take place will, will go from the atypical to the typical. We don't have to give people a chart of human growth and development at particular ages and what is normal and what is not. We can give them a case, and through the process of solving the case, of solving the problem, they will come to that learning. I can't give you a a whole problem-based learning um, opportunity today, but I'm going to give you a small one, and I, I hope you have fun with it. I actually had two, but oh, I'm not going to have enough time to do the. I have a little video of some teachers going through a problem-based learning case, but I think instead of doing that, that was the first one, uh, working with music teachers in a pilot session, I'm going to give you the opportunity to engage in a case. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do first. And then once we get physically organized to do this, I'll take you to the next step. Does that sound fair? into talking about how powerful something like this would be at the first faculty meeting of the year when you have new teachers and experienced teachers together, the new teachers bringing in all of their ideas from all of their university work, the experienced teachers bringing in all of their experience, that's going to be very powerful for the new teacher. They can take what they know, get all of the experience, and then make it fit their own style. We also talked about, for those of us in the room that are from California, how powerful something like this would be in BITSA work. Our beginning teacher um, 
all of our new teachers have to go through the support system to clear their credentials and get their uh, permanent credentials. Um, and then I started thinking, regular faculty meetings, to do little mini exercises like we just did. What's coming up in the next month? And that's gonna help the experienced and the new uh, teacher. I think it would enrich any model of, uh, of teacher education. Uh, and I see this is derived clearly from your studies of medical education and medical-based teaching. But I see a missing element between our current conception of teacher education and the medical model that uh, is not addressed by the problem-based approach. It's a, a missing element, a kind of an elephant in the living room thing. When medical professors teach their medical students like in grand rounds, they go to the patient at their bedside, uh, ask the medical intern to make a diagnosis, just like on house or something like that. And then uh, ultimately that professor of medicine performs the accurate diagnosis and they discuss the adequacies and inadequacies of the student responses. Let me cut to the chase here. The candidates see the doctor in the professor. But I don't believe my candidates see the teacher in this professor and won't until they see me standing in the front of the classroom before 30 or 35 kids modeling effective instruction. I could show videos of that effective instruction, but the credibility in me as a professor of teacher education is lacking because they don't see me as a practitioner at the grade levels and in the subject areas for which I am preparing to teach. We're at the forefront of that march. Those of us who have taken creed to heart, who have experienced problem-based or creed-based learning, who have seen the light in children's eyes when they're solving problems and they're allowed to bring what they, the gifts they have to the table, and work at higher levels without fear of getting the wrong answer on the multiple choice test. We've been there, so we know. This is just one way to maybe think about inserting it into teacher preparation programs and, and then hopefully trickling down into K-12.